In the second part of this modern mind-body problem lecture, we're going to deal with modern versions of the dualism account. That is that there are two kinds of thing in the universe and they can't really be reduced to one another. The three positions we're going to be covering are what I've called property dualisms, epiphenomenalism of Huxley, the panpsychism of Nagel, and the emergent materialism of Chalmers. As I said before, we're going to take each one in turn and look at a general description, arguments for, and then arguments against. The first of our dualisms is epiphenomenalism. Now, there are various accounts of all of these things I'm going to introduce. There's not just one person associated with it, but for the for the sake of the lecture series, I'm going to give you one person that's come up once or twice, maybe before, uh, and, and show you what they thought about this position. Something else I'm going to be doing is showing you these um, circles and arrows as a way to explain approximately what the theoretical position shows. And in these circles and arrows, we've got um, P1 and P2, and they are supposed to be physical states, so physical states of, of the brain or the body. And then we've got M1 and M2, and these are mental states. For example, P1 could be higher activity in your hypothalamus, and P2 could be, uh, I don't know, a large flash on your visual cortex. Whereas M1 could be feeling hungry or thinking about dogs, whereas M2 could be perceiving uh, a flash of light. So that's the general notation that I'm going to be using to try and explain these ideas. Okay, so epiphenomenalism is a belief in which they accept that the physical brain does cause mental states. So P1 there is pointing to M1. So the physical state of the brain P1 causes the mental state M1. So P1 could be you know, activity in your visual cortex and M1 could be a flash of light that you perceive. But in epiphenomenalism, the mental states just sort of exist on their own. They're, they're caused by the physical states, but they don't actually do anything themselves. So while the physical brain causes mental states, mental states themselves have no causal role in changing either physical states or changing other mental states. So from the arrow in the diagram, you can see that P1 causes P2. So higher activity in your visual cortex might lead to higher activity in your motor cortex in your brain. But M1 doesn't lead to M2. So seeing a flash of light in your mind doesn't necessarily lead to you making a response or urging the will to move. So Huxley illustrated his idea of epiphenomenalism by saying that the mind was essentially like the bell on a clock. The bell has no role at all in keeping time, so the clock will work, regardless or not of whether the bell is working or, or, or whether the bell is even heard or the bell has any function. So time is kept by the clock, but the bell does nothing. It's just a, a phenomenon, a thing which sits on top of the clock itself, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's an epiphenomenon, epi means sort of above or over. So an epiphenomenon, the mind is an epiphenomenon of the body. And Huxley, as we learned from previous uh, lectures, was um, a friend of Darwin or Darwin's bulldog. And he was very much influenced by evolutionary and um, biological processes. And he thought actually that, that animals and humans are actually all automatons, they're robots. So before Darwin, it was thought that the animals were automatons and only humans really had a mind and a and a soul and a, and a free will and so on. Um, but Darwin put a put a stop to all that sort of thought. And so now instead, both animals and humans have to be thought of in the same way. And so Huxley's solution to this was to think that humans were also automatons, just like the animals. And that actually makes some sense. So animals and humans are now automatons. Um, the feeling we have of controlling our own body is actually a, an illusion. So it's actually just an epiphenomenon. The mind is just sort of the froth on, on the ocean of the waves of the brain. So that's epiphenomenalism. Why did Huxley think it and what's the evidence for it? So Huxley lived through some of the first developments in neuropsychology. So he would have been aware of lots of patients who had 
brain damage and then lost particular functions um, or who, who they may have lost a function but they may not actually be aware of it so for example if you lose your visual cortex you might behave as if you can see or you might respond to a to a doctor who's asking you what you can see you might respond that you can see but in fact you can't see a thing so there are these strange neuropsychological cases where what people say and what people say they're aware of doesn't really seem to bear any relationship to how their brain actually is. So that's a good reason to think that the mind is sort of an epiphenomenon. It doesn't always reflect actually what's going on in the brain and your conscious awareness is not a straightforward uh, account of your mental states. So the second reason to favour epiphenomenalism is that, well, behaviourism has done really quite well without it, without the mind. So behaviorism sort of got rid of the mind as a concept because it didn't really help understand stimuli and responses. So by saying that, okay, we have mental states, but they don't do anything, so we can just sort of ignore them while we get on with our behaviorism science. So a third kind of evidence for epiphenomenalism might be from uh, neurophysiological studies in humans and other animals. One particular example that's been given several times is by Libet and this is an idea that if you record from the brain from the motor areas of the brain just before people make decisions so decide to move their finger for example you can find that there's some signals that build up as much as a second or half a second before the subject says that they were actually intending to move their finger and from Libet studies and other considerations there's the idea that our conscious awareness sort of takes quite a long time to happen after the brain states that cause it. So we're not aware of the things that, that are going on in our brain that are causing our behaviour. So from this view, feeling like we're in control of our own body is just an illusion. It's an epiphenomenon of, of the real things that are going on underneath in the brain. So those are the arguments that people have made for an epiphenomenalism. Similarly, there have been some arguments against it, and Huxley really should have seen the first one coming, because an evolutionary argument might go that if the mind really does have no causal role at all, it doesn't cause mental states and it, it doesn't interact with or cause physical states, then why, why do we have a mind? Why has it evolved? If humans are you know, one of the most complex brainy species on the planet, why, why do we have a mind if it has no function? The second problem for epiphenomenalism is the same as with substance dualism, the problem of interaction. So yeah, okay, physical states cause mental states, but how do they interact? Um, given that mental states are somehow special because they're, they're not causal and they don't cause each other and they sort of sit on top and float around on top of the body and the brain, how is it that the physical states interact with the mental states? That's not, that's not made clear in the epiphenomenal view. A third argument is the kind of thing that philosophers like, like to do, is sort of these logical arguments, and they have some tie themselves in, in knots trying to make these arguments. So one thing is, how, how can we know about the existence of the mind if the mind can't affect the brain? And it's one of those philosophical arguments. So if the mind is a thing which is caused by the brain, how does the mind itself know that it, that it was produced by the same brain? How can it sort of tell the brain, I'm here, I'm the mind, I'm here, and, uh, and you need to know about me? Uh, yeah, so there's some sort of logical co contradiction, I think the argument goes, that um, the mind, if the mind has any causal properties, it should at least be able to cause the idea of the mind in the brain itself. It's slightly confusing. Um, and then another argument is actually from Libet as well. So he, although he said that it seems like we, we, we don't control uh, uh, our bodies, he did actually say that we do in fact have some sort of conscious veto. So we can stop actions, even though actions might be sort of developing without our awareness or, or, we, or they come before we're consciously aware of deciding things, we can still decide to stop them later on. So there is some, there is some control. So that's epiphenomenalism. Thomas Nagel has a famous article called What is it like to be a bat? And I've put the reading on the um, on the, um, the shared space, the Moodle space. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to read that. It's quite short. It's quite fun. It talks about bats and aliens and all sorts of different sensory experiences. And from reasoning and thinking about bats and other things, Thomas Nagel came to the conclusion that it's probably the case that everything in nature, everything in the universe has some sort of mental properties. So there's sort of like a micro consciousness, if you like. 
everything has consciousness. Maybe only a little bit of consciousness, but everything has it. And so the, the diagram I've produced here are these blue circles that represent the, the physical matter, the brain, if you like, brain states. And then sitting on top of the brain states are these, these red circles. And it, they're not the same as the brain states. It's not the same as a physical property, but it's like a, an additional non-physical property of, of the brain. And the one important thing about this is this physical property hasn't, this non, sorry, this non-physical property hasn't been discovered yet. They're hypothesizing a new property that will be discovered about all forms of matter, which gives it consciousness and, and mental properties. So by physical properties, they mean things like space, time, energy, and mass, the kind of things that a physicist could write equations about and do experiments on by, by measuring and recording and, and moving particles at the speed of light. That's the kind of thing they mean by physical properties. But they sort of have to invent this sort of extra mental property, which is a non-physical property, which they mean by uh, it can't just can't be explained using normal physics. So it's like they require a new kind of physics before you can explain panpsychism. It's a little bit of a complicated view, and we'll see that there are problems with it. But here are some reasons why Nagel gave this view. So he started from four premises. And a premise is like an assumption. So if we if we accept that all these four things are true, then you have to accept that everything has, has a mind, is what Nagel was saying. So the first thing is Nagel is putting forward a materialist view. So although we're talking about dualisms, uh, it's, more, it's a property dualism. So everything is matter in his view. Materialism is true. But he also thinks that the mind is a real thing. We're not, we're not mistaken or confused. That the mind is a real thing and we have to try and explain it. The third thing he says, well, we can't reduce the mind to a physical state. So there is really a, a problem, a dualist problem. Mind and physic, mind and body are not the same thing and we, we can't reduce one to the other. We need to explain them both. And the fourth thing is that he says mind doesn't somehow sort of magically emerge from a physical state. So we'll talk about emergence in the next part of the lecture. But it's a special kind of emergence that if you have a complex physical system, you can describe all the components of that system. But there'll be new things which arise from the interaction of those complicated components. So from Nagel's four premises, he concludes that in that case, if you accept all of these four things, then we must also conclude that all matter has consciousness, has mind. And this, for him, solves the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem is um, a famous article by David Chalmers, and I've put that in the reading for you as well, if you want to read that. And the hard problem of consciousness is essentially, why does it feel like this to, to have consciousness? Why, when you look at a, a flower, do you see a particular colour? Why does it feel that way to you? And that's the hard problem, the idea of subjective experience. Another possible helpful argument for panpsychism is that quantum physics is relatively new and it's quite strange and there should be a whole load of new physical laws and properties that come out of quantum physics and it could be that quantum physics is going to provide us with a theory of consciousness and that everything every particle in the universe has a sort of micro consciousness a quantum consciousness if you will so that's why nagel thought that everything has consciousness because there were these four things he, he agreed with, and so he felt the conclusion was that, well, everything's got consciousness. But why might we doubt this panpsychism view? Well, as will be uh, clear in lectures 9 and 10 in this series, if you're trying to say something which can't really be tested scientifically, then it's not really saying anything at all. So at the, at the moment, at least, we can't test this theory because we have no way of even thinking about what could a non-physical property of, of physical things be. You know, physics is relatively well defined and there are things that physics can't explain yet, but physics isn't complete. So we can't just invent particles, invent consciousness to explain consciousness. Essentially what they're doing is inventing consciousness to explain itself. And John Searle, who's a, an arch critic of all sorts of positions in in the mind and brain he said it's worse than just being untestable it's it's not even a theory yet it doesn't even have the the pretense of being a theory it's just sort of a, 
a placeholder. It's just saying, well, we'll find we'll find a property of, of matter one day which which corresponds to consciousness, and that's it. So it hasn't really done very well in terms of being a, a, an empirically testable theory. And the panpsychists might reply saying, aha, well, you may not have evidence for it, but there's also no evidence against it. And it is rather elegant. Uh, well, it could be elegant. <laughs> it can be elegant and, and false as well as elegant and true. So that that's the state of panpsychism. Um, we're not really sure whether it's a really worked out theory. It sounds a bit mystical. You know, everything has consciousness, every Every rock, every every animal, every every microbe has consciousness. Maybe even a little virus would have a little bit of consciousness. So at the moment, panpsychism seems to sort of fit in a position along with psychoanalysis, phrenology, physiognomy, and all the all the other sort of pseudosciences that we've been talking about. But lots of lots of sensible people sort of end up in this position that in that case consciousness just must be a fundamental mat matter principle of the universe. And it's not clear how we could prove that either way. The third and final of our modern dualisms, then, is what I'm calling emergent or non-reductive materialism. And this is um, sometimes associated with Chalmers, although I'm not sure how Chalmers himself would, would describe it. And this is the idea that there are definitely two kinds of stuff, or two kinds of things, two kinds of properties, as mind and as body, and there are causal relationships between body and mind. This position would say that all mental states are caused by a physical state, but that men mental states do not always cause other mental states, and they're not really clearly causes of physical states either. So the view is that mind depends upon the body and the brain, but it's somehow not the same as or reducible to the body and the brain. We'll, we'll deal with this again in the next session, but the emergent part is... That when you've got a complex physical system like the brain and lots of physical processes going on, that the complex organisation and interaction of all these physical structures reveals new properties and new states, mental states, that were not really present in the individual bits of brain, the individual neurons or the individual electrical discharges. So there's something that sits sort of over and above the brain, which is not identical to the brain, and it's not explainable by the brain, but, but somehow it depends on. And I'm, you, you may guess I'm not quite clear on what this position is either, but let's have a look at what some of the proponents might say. So let's take an example, and I think, I'm not sure who would use this example, but it's the one I came up with to try and think about how you might get different levels of a physical system which produces emergent properties that are not explainable at the level of the the lower properties. So think about the case of water. At the molecular level, what I'm calling nano here, water is H2O, so there's a hydrogen, hydrogen and an oxygen atom, all bound together. And you can describe the properties of atoms at that level, you know, how they're bonded together, maybe how they behave when they're hot or cold, or when they come into uh, contact with other molecules. And that's one level of explanation about water, H2O. Another level, which I'm calling the micro level, might be to think of water as how it behaves in ice and crystals and snowflakes. Um, it's clearly very different, and you might not be able to predict the way that H2O, the molecular formula for water, might end up giving you these beautiful snowflakes on your window. And then an, an, another level of explanation or another level of properties of water. You can think about tsunamis and great waves and sort of the whole planet, or the whole oceans of the planet moving moving together, followed by the moon and so on, that you could describe the properties of water in terms of tsunamis and how they move at you know, hundreds of metres a second across the ocean floor. So the idea here is that water is both H2O and its ice crystals and its tsunamis and its waves and tides, and it's not clear that you can explain all of these things in a straightforward or easy way just from the properties of H2O. So the analogy here with the brain is that H2O is like the neurons, the micro level is maybe like individual brain areas or individual processes, and the macro level might be like consciousness. And it's sort of very difficult to explain 
how one might lead to the other. So the behaviour of tsunami can't really easily be reduced to the behaviour of H2O unless you're able to take into account all of the many constraints of a particular physical system. So if you think of the whole planet as a single, phys a single physical system, then yeah, you might be able to explain how tsunamis are created. But it'd be very difficult to explain those things at, at the level of H2O molecules. So the higher level properties emerge from the lower level properties within the constraints of a particular physical system. So it's definitely all physical, it's just almost impossible or impossible to explain how these, these properties come about. And why might you disagree with this? Well, one response is just to say, well, yeah, okay, it's difficult. I, I can accept that higher level properties can emerge from lower level properties, but they're all still physical properties. There's nothing especially mental about you know these these physical properties that and we, we just have to accept maybe that complicated physical properties are mental states and less complicated are physical states so that's one sort of intuition view that i thought another view is to ask about the causal structure of mental and physical states so if physical states cause physical states and physical states cause mental states but mental states don't cause physical states then what are the mental states doing? If they're not really participating in this causal chain, if they're not actually causing physical states to change, then they have no causal role. And this seems, again, like another version of epiphenomenalism. You know, the mind is there, it's real, it's interesting, but it, but it doesn't actually do anything. And if you argue that, argue that mental states actually do cause physical states, as some uh, non-reductive materialists do, then you might as well just say that mental states just are physical states. And this argument was made by um, Kim, the Korean scientist, Korean philosopher, who argued this is the over-determination. So you don't need multiple causes for physical states. For a physical state, you only need to be caused by another physical state. You don't need, on a, in addition, a mental state to cause a physical state. So mental states have no causal role in this view. And that's a problem. Okay, so those are our property dualisms, um, and just to give you a very quick overview of the pros and cons of epiphenomenalism with Huxley, um, it seemed to be a good explanation of some sorts of neuropsychology and neuroscience where the will or the, the conscious awareness of the brain doesn't seem to play any part or any role. But against this idea is the, the sort of intuition and the logic that um, mind does seem to have a role in, in our in our in our lives and uh, if it's purely an epiphenomenon then that just doesn't seem very satisfactory. For Nagel, panpsychism solves the hard problem of consciousness. It, it just it postulates a new property of all matter that is consciousness and then that that explains everything because every little particle in the universe has a bit of consciousness and when they all when they all bind together in a brain you get even you know you get beautiful consciousness. Uh, the problem with that is, of course, it's untestable and unscientific. So it could be true, but how are we actually going to check whether it's true? And for the emergent materialism or the non-reductive materialisms, the basic claim is that the interactions of matter can be very complicated and that new properties can emerge from lower levels that, that couldn't have been predicted from the lower levels. And against this view is the, is the problem that, well, if mind doesn't really have a causal role, then again, what is it doing in the brain at all? So those are our dualisms. Uh, confusing stuff, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully not too confusing. Um, but do ask some questions at the Q&A and we'll try and get to the bottom of uh, which one of these is the right answer.